valuation of common stocks it is often said that there is no easy way to beat the market that is predict a superior investment performance remember our discussion on liquid and efficient markets still one would like to price equity securities and compare the pricing across different company stocks also there is a more fundamental reason to value securities for example stocks that is to see if managers are acting in the best interest of the firm for example they should only accept those projects that increase the firm value but to attain this objective it is necessary to understand what determines a share's price we start the discussion with the basics of trading operations and the functioning of exchanges we explore why market values are important and therefore the need to establish well functioning liquid and efficient financial markets then we understand the fundamental principles of stock valuation and the use of dcf models to estimate the expected returns dcf methods not only help value individual stocks but also entire businesses we start with a simple one period investment in a stock then we extend the argument for a multi period investment to establish a generic formula for stock valuation in this process we also see how growth and superior returns affect stock price attributes such as price earnings ratio trading of securities on exchanges in this video we'll discuss the basics of trading operations and functioning of exchanges a large company such as amazon has millions of shares being traded that is 507 million and market capitalization that runs in trillions that is 1.735 trillion dollars in such firms investors comprise a small number of investors and a small group of large institutional investors such as pension funds and insurance companies if amazon wants to raise more capital it can do so by borrowing or selling new shares to investors this issuance of new shares to raise capital occurs in primary markets however such primary issuance is an infrequent phenomena most of the trading takes place on the stock exchanges often called trading in secondary markets at these exchanges investors buy and sell shares that are listed on the exchange put simply stocks are traded on exchanges often referred to as secondary markets on these exchanges buyers and sellers trade the stocks amongst each other this kind of secondary trading transactions only transfer the ownership from one owner to the other no new shares are created these investor orders are often submitted to exchanges through brokers generally modern day electronic trading happens through two broad category of orders often referred to as market orders and limit orders market order is an order to trade immediately at the best available prices limit orders state a price limit for execution if that price limit is met then only the order is executed till then the limit order is stored in the exchange's limit order book the secondary trading has no direct impact on the firm operations of course this buying and selling activity reflects the approval or disapproval of shareholders on the actions of firm managers and therefore has an indirect impact modern day trading of securities on exchanges such as new york stock exchange or national stock exchange of india occurs through computer networks often referred to as electronic communication networks that connect the traders and brokers with the exchange the present day trading requires the shares to be stored in the dematerialized that is demat form unlike the paper documentation that was there in the times of fiscal trading most of the modern day markets are auction markets where the auction is conducted by computers in addition to auction markets some markets are called dealer broker markets in these markets exchanges designate a market maker that is designated market makers or dmms often called the dealer who is willing to buy or sell large volume of specific securities at exchanges she provides buy and sell quotes in a continuous manner to maintain orderly trading at the exchange in a given set of securities these exchanges also summarize daily data on their websites for public consumption this helps in wider information dissemination and facilitates efficient price discovery to summarize in this video we discussed how modern financial markets leverage upon electronic communication networks and limit order books to facilitate large volume of trades at an extremely fast pace this helps in efficient price discovery through wide information dissemination market value of common stocks we understand why market values are important benchmarks to understand the performance of a firm as evaluated by the investors and other market participants every quarter listed companies release their accounts this includes a balance sheet with details of assets and liabilities these values are called book values it is a certain tangible number assigned to various firm parameters such as equity assets among others these accounting numbers are based on opinions of auditors such as kpmg pwc and deloitte 
Also, these accounting numbers are prepared according to and following international financial reporting standards as adopted by the country in which the firm operates. So why not rely on these book values for various requirements and applications? While book value of an asset is reassuring definite and tangible figure, it essentially measures their historical value or cost of acquisition after reducing the depreciation. This may not be an accurate representation of what these assets are worth today. Organizations often purchase assets that have more value than their cost of acquisition. Remember the positive NPV rule? Therefore, the market prices of firm stocks are often more than their book values. Stock prices can also be less than book values if the firm is doing poorly and taking projects that have negative NPVs. Financial analysts often argue that markets are efficient, that is, prices observed in financial markets reflect the true and efficient value of the firms. However, very often projects, businesses that need to be valued are not publicly traded. Financial analysts while valuing such firms or a business follow a method called valuation by comparables. In this method, we identify a group of similar firms that are listed and publicly traded. That is, firms that operate with similar business risk and similar nature of operations. Then they try to examine how much the investors are willing to pay for these firms for each dollar of their assets or earnings as provided on their books. Therefore, two parameters become particularly important for such analysis. First, market to book ratio, that is market value of equity divided by the book value of equity. Second, P ratio, share price divided by earnings reported in the profit and loss statement. Consider the hypothetical values of market to book ratio and P ratio provided here. The values are provided for firms and the average values for competitors in their industry. In case these companies were not listed entities, then you would rely on the industry averages. For example, consider Johnson & Johnson. If it was not listed, then you would have considered its equity to be of three times than of its book value and computed its stock price. Or alternatively, you would have looked at its earnings and multiplied them by 10.9, which is the industry average. It is no guarantee that these two numbers will agree with each other. Very often they may not. Still, these estimates ensure that you have some comparable benchmarks and your estimates from fundamental valuation methods such as discounted cash flows can be compared with the current market view. To summarize, in this video, we discussed that market prices observed in liquid and efficient markets are a useful tool to judge the firm performance and that of the projects undertaken by the firm. Investors and analysts often use market prices to value and compare firms with similar business risks. Important ratios such as market to book and price to earning ratios for unlisted non-traded firms along with market prices of traded firms help market participants understand how much investors are willing to pay for these unlisted firms for which market prices may not be available. Fundamental Valuation of Stocks Part 1 will be introduced to the fundamental valuation of common stocks. We will apply discounted cash flow that is DCF valuation techniques to value common stocks. The comparable valuation method provides estimates of value that are more aligned to the current market expectations. However, it is no guarantee that these expectations are true and efficient. For that, fundamental valuation methods provide rather appropriate estimates. In order to perform the fundamental valuation of stocks, we need to know what are these factors that affect stock prices. Recollect our previous discussion of discounted cash flow method. The same can also be applied to a security, whether stock or bonds. Stockholders receive dividends from the company. It is easy to see where we are going with this. The present value of all such dividends, if discounted with appropriate interest rates that reflect the risk of equity owners, should result in the value of the firm. That is, present value of stock equal to present value of expected future dividend income. Please note that when we are talking about dividends, these are not the past dividend income. These are future expected dividends that depend upon the future ability or, or capacity of the firm to pay dividends. Let us understand this through a simple example. When you plan to buy a stock, you expect your returns or payoffs in two forms. First, you expect to receive dividends. Second, you expect capital gains or sometimes losses. That is, if you sell the shares, the price at which you sell may be different from the buy price. If things go well, you plan to sell the stock at a profit. Of course, these profits will come to you after paying the taxes. Let us say that you bought this stock at a price P0. You plan to sell this stock next year. By the end of the year, the price is expected to be P1. 
and the firm has announced a dividend of div 1 by the end of this year. If you plan to compute the returns from this investment, assuming no taxes, your return should be computed as shown here. Expected returns are equal to div 1 plus p1 minus p0 divided by p0. Notice that these are expected returns predicted by you, not the actual returns. This is so because you are expecting a sale price of p1 at the end of year. This may not be the actual price. The actual price can be more or less than the expected price. Now let us examine this discount rate R. This is often called the market capitalization rate or cost of equity capital or the returns expected by shareholders given the risk of the firm. All the companies with the same risk will face the same discount rate. Let us put some numbers here. Consider a company ABC with the current price P0 equal to $100 dividends expected at the end of the year div 1 five dollars and an expected price of 110 dollars at the end of the year then the expected returns by shareholders would be computed as shown here r equal to div 1 plus p1 minus p0 upon p0 equal to 5 plus 110 minus 100 upon 100 equal to 15 percent let us make this example more interesting assume that 15 percent is the interest that you or other investors are expecting from the stock and those stocks having similar risk. The dividends div 1 $5 and the future expected price P1 $110 are known to you. Now if you are asked to compute the present value of this stock then what should be the fair efficient price of the stock? You can simply discount the cash flows at the appropriate discount rate to estimate the true and efficient price. The computation is rather simple as shown here. P0 equal to div 1 plus P1 upon 1 plus R equal to 5 plus 110 upon 1.5 equal to $100. A very important point to be noted here is that this $100 price, you compute it based on your expectation of the stock price one year from today and the discount rate based on the risk of the stock. The actual price at which this stock is trading may not be the same. For example, the actual price at which this stock is trading can be more or less. However, if you truly believe in your computation and consumptions, then if the share price observed in market is more than your estimates of true and fair price, you would argue that market price is overvalued. If the market is overvalued and many investors feel the same way, what should they do? They would shift their capital to other securities that are efficiently valued. As more and more investors do the same, the price of the security would fall and align with the efficient values estimated by the investors. Similarly, if the market price observed is less than the true and efficient price computed by you, then you would argue that market price is undervalued. Again, investors will place more and more capital in the stock and its price will rise to become efficient. Remember our discussion of good systems of corporate governance, wherein we said that investors buy or sell stocks to display their approval or disapproval of managers' selection of value decreasing or increasing projects. This is precisely that mechanism. To summarize, in this video, we examine the factors that affect the valuation of common stocks. Common stocks are interesting instruments with an indefinite lifetime. Investors who own these stocks expect returns in the form of dividends and finally capital appreciation at that time of the sale of the share. Thus, the current value of the stock P0 can be expressed in the form of dividends Div1 and capital appreciation at the end of the period in the following manner. P0 equal to Div1 plus P1 upon 1 plus R. Where R is the market capitalization rate or cost of equity capital for the firm. Many times the actual price may not be the same as the price estimated here. Then if the buyers or sellers actively trade in the market to drive it towards efficient values, depending upon whether the share is underpriced or overpriced. This mechanism facilitates efficient price discovery and helps attain equilibrium in financial markets. We will develop and understand a generic formula for the valuation of common stocks with the help of dividends. We will see how discounting the dividend cash flows helps in estimating the current share price. Till now, we have explained the current price P0 in terms of this year's dividend Div1 and the price that is expected at the end of the year P1. Let us move towards a more generic formula for the current year price P0. Let us examine the price of the stock next year that is P1. Similar to P0, we can also write this price P1 in terms of dividend Div2, price expected at the end of the second year P2 and discount rate R. This formula is shown here, P1 equal to Div2 plus P2 upon 1 plus R. Subsequently, we can also write the current price P0 in terms of dividends for next two years, Div1 and Div2 and price at the end of the second year P2. 
This is shown in the expression provided here. P not equal to div one upon one plus r plus div two upon one plus r raised to the power two plus p two upon one plus r raised to the power two. Let us further consider the example of a company A B C. The investors are expecting a dividend of five point five dollars in year two, a price of one twenty one dollars at the end of year two. The current price can be easily estimated with these numbers as computed here. P not equal to five upon one point one five plus five point five upon one point one five raised to the power two plus one twenty one upon one point one five raised to the power two equal to hundred dollars. This expansion of current price P not can be further extended to three, four, or more periods. It should be clear now where we are going with this. Consider a rather large horizon of H periods and the expected price at the end of the horizon as P H. The current price can be easily expressed in terms of dividends received during this period and the price obtained at the end. That is pH. This can be written as shown here. P not equal to div one upon one plus r plus div two upon one plus r raised to the power two plus div three upon one plus r raised to the power three, and so on up till div h plus pH upon one plus r raised to the power h. The expression summation div t upon one plus r raised to the power t from t equal to one to h indicates the discounted sum that is present values of dividends for years one to h. Thus. The value of current share price P not has two components: one, the present value of dividends to be received over the investment horizon; second, the present value of the sale price at the end of the investment period. Let us put some numbers here with the following example: Consider a hundred period horizon with ten percent growth in dividends and prices year on year. The resulting figures are provided in the table shown here. Columns two and three represent the expected future values of dividends and prices. Column four presents The present value of the total expected dividends to be received if the stock is held till that year. Column five represents the present value of the expected sale price for that year. For example, the investor that holds the stock for hundred periods will receive a total present value of hundred dollars. Out of this, ninety-eight point eight three dollars come from the dividends received over the investment period, and one point one seven dollars come from the sale of the share. Interesting to note that for all periods, the total present value that is PV remains. The same at hundred dollars. However, it may be noted that investors with different horizons, the composition of present value, that is PV, of dividend and sale price varies. Let us examine these values with the help of the figure shown here. It can be easily observed that for investors with long horizons, the present value PV of dividends has the major share in the value of current price. In contrast, for the investor with small horizons, the major share of the current price comes from the sale price and A rather small share from the PV of dividends. However, these two are not entirely different things. Essentially, even for short horizon investors, the value of sale price is determined by expectations of dividends only. Therefore, we can obtain a more generic expression for the current price P not by assuming an infinitely large period. The key point to remember here is that as the investment horizon increases and H becomes infinitely large. The present value of the sale price approaches zero. The assumption of infinitely large investment horizon in a stock is not unrealistic. Remember our discussion of separation of ownership and control. This offers longevity to the firm and the stock survives many human lifetimes. Therefore, our resulting expression for the current price of stock simplifies as shown below. That is, P not equal to div t upon one plus r raised to the power t, where t equal to one to infinity. At times, this formula of discounting dividends may not seem very intuitive, as it does not factor the capital gains. However, if you remember the assumption that was used to derive this formula, that is, future prices that are used to compute capital gains are essentially determined by the future expectations of dividends only. Often, we get confused by thinking that this current price should reflect the discounted present values of earnings. If one discounts the earnings, then it would be double counting of cash flows. as the investment into plant and machinery would also be included in the earnings this investment has resulted in the sustained and sometimes increasing dividend levels therefore using earnings would lead to double counting of benefits and it is only appropriate to use discounted dividends to compute the share price lastly many companies especially young growth firms with large capital requirements do not pay dividends and therefore their valuation comes becomes more complicated however their valuations are also not inconsistent with this model this is so because sometime in future their shareholders are expecting them to become profitable and distribute these profits in the form of dividends 
or alternatively they expect their share prices of these companies to soar and get their hands on money by selling a certain fraction of these shares held by them this explains the share price of the firm that have been making losses for example negative cash flows year on year for many years to summarize in this video we discussed how simple one period price estimation can be extended into generic form of h periods that is price can be expressed in terms of present values of dividends received over h periods and the capital appreciation through the sale of share at the end of the period as shown here that is p not equal to div t upon 1 plus r raised to the power t t from 1 to h plus p h upon 1 plus r raised to the power h we also noted that as the investment horizon increases the present value of capital appreciation component declines as the investment horizon becomes infinite the current value of share comes entirely from the expression expectations of present value of dividends to be received in the future indefinitely however many young growth firms do not pay regular and stable dividends and in fact often incur losses then this formula may not be easily applied to them dividend discount model and cost of equity capital will understand the valuation of companies with growing earnings and dividends will also understand the relationship between growth cost of equity that is market capitalization rate and dividend yield let us put our knowledge of dcf valuation through dividends to practice assume a constant long term growth rate of g in dividends and an appropriate discount rate r this is similar to valuing that growing perpetuity as we discussed in the previous topics assuming a dividend of div1 in the first year this perpetuity can be valued using the formula shown here p not equal to div1 upon r minus g again this g is the anticipated growth rate and is less than r for this formula to remain viable the discount rate must be more than this growth rate this growing perpetuity formula explains the current price p not in terms of expected dividend div1 growth g and expected return on the securities of the same risk r also if the current price p not is observed this formula can be used to estimate r as shown here r equal to div1 upon p not plus g this formula shows that the discount rate r or expected returns equals the dividend yield div1 upon p not and the expected rate of growth g this r is often referred to as the expected return or cost of equity let us understand this through a simple example if you wish to estimate this cost of equity for a firm xyz having a share price of 42.45 dollars at the start of the period also that expected dividends starting from the year end amount to 1.68 dollars per share the dividend yield for this stock can be simply computed as dividend yield equal to div1 upon p0 equal to 1.68 upon 42.45 equal to 4% the second part that is estimating long term growth rate g is rather difficult let us discuss about this long term growth rate a simple argument to link with the payout ratio that is ratio of dividends to earnings for example if the payout ratio is 60% that also means the company is plowing back 40% of earnings back into the business that is plow back ratio equal to 1 minus payout ratio equal to 1 minus dividend upon earning per share equal to 1 minus 0.6 equal to 0.40 this growth rate g can be expressed as return on equity and the amount invested back in the firm expressed in the form of plow back ratio growth rate g equal to plow back ratio into return on equity if the return on equity is 10% and plow back ratio is 40% then the growth rate g can be calculated with the simple formula g equal to 40% into 10% equal to 4% if the estimate of this growth is 4% then your overall estimate of cost of equity capital r for the firm xyz can be easily shown here r equal to div1 upon p0 plus g equal to 4% plus 4% equal to 8% please note that this estimate of cost of equity is at best an estimate only such estimates are often noisy and prone to errors of estimation these estimates such as r if computed using single company data then this noise can be rather high to improve these estimates it is advisable to use multiple companies that is large sample of equivalent risk securities and consider average estimates these averages often help in reducing the noise component that is often associated with single company estimates also please note that the constant growth dividend discount formula employed earlier is extremely sensitive to changes in the values of g and r therefore before applying this formula one may need to be sure that the current high rates of growth may not be sustainable in the long term that is the constant growth dcf formula assumes the growth rate g to continue in perpetuity organizations often witness periods of high growth rates due to 
favorable operational operating environments however these high growth rates are not sustainable in long term thus the assumption of long term growth g needs to be made with caution consider this example of a firm with equity of 25 dollars dividend at the end of the year div1 equal to 0.5 dollars and p0 equal to 50 dollars that is current price the firm has an roe that is return on equity of 25% and payout ratio of 20% let us first compute the cost of equity for this firm with the simple constant growth dcf formula the return on equity that is roe can be simply computed in two steps as shown here first dividend growth rate equal to 1 minus payout ratio into return on equity equal to 1 minus 0.2 into 0.25 equal to 20% notice that this growth rate seems to be unusually high the cost of equity computed with this growth rate would work out to r equal to dividend yield plus g equal to 0.5 upon 50 plus 20% equal to 21% but of course we know better no firm can sustain a growth rate of 21% infinitely into future in real life such growth rates stop gradually over the years and attain that lower long term growth that is sustainable to simplify things here assume that the firm roe that is return on equity drops to 16% in the third year also that the payout ratio increases to 50% it is natural for firms to increase the payout ratio during initial growth phases it is usual for firm to flow back large proportion of earnings however as the firm matures investment opportunities diminish and more and more earnings are available for distribution among shareholders so now we have new growth figure that is g equal to 50% into 16% equal to 8% let us see the timeline of cash flows as shown here in order to compute the current price p0 one needs to use the dcf formula in two stages first the high growth phase and second the steady state growth phase in the high growth phase we need to value the three dividend flows in year 1 2 and 3 present value of dividends obtained in years 1 2 and 3 equal to div 1 upon 1 plus r plus div 2 upon 1 plus r is to power 2 plus div 3 upon 1 plus r is to power 3 steady state growth phase with cash flows in perpetuity can be valued simply as shown here p3 upon 1 plus r is to power 3 equal to div 4 upon r minus g into 1 upon 1 plus r is to power 3 we also know that the current price is observed as 50 dollars the resulting expression is provided here 50 equal to div 1 upon 1 plus r plus div 2 upon 1 plus r raised to power 2 plus div 3 upon 1 plus r raised to power 3 plus div 4 upon r minus g into 1 upon 1 plus r raised to power 3. Once we put the numbers here, 50 equal to 0.5 upon 1 plus r plus 0.6 upon 1 plus r raised to power 2 plus 1.15 upon 1 plus r raised to power 3 plus 1.245 upon r minus 0.08 into 1 upon 1 plus r raised to power 3. solving for this equation we get a value of r equal to 9.94% these pv computations employed a two stage dcf valuation model in the first stage the high growth phase the firm was highly profitable that is return on equity equal to 25% and it plowed back 80% of earnings this resulted in a high growth rate of 20% third year onwards profitability declined and payout increased that is dividends increased that is less money flowed back the long term growth rate settled at a steady state rate of 8% this example can be suitably extended to three or more stages of different growth regimes for example first phase at growth rate of 20% second phase of 12% and finally the steady state at growth rate of 8% in this case the present value will be computed in three stages we close this discussion with a caveat that chances are your dcf valuation of stock may not be consistent with those observed in the financial markets this could be due to the fact that markets may not agree with your growth projections or dividend forecast or cost of equity capital estimates small variations in any of these estimates often lead to wide variations in the stock valuations to summarize in this video we computed the current share price for firms with growing earnings and dividends using the dividend growth model shown here that is p0 equal to div1 upon r minus g here g is the anticipated long term steady state growth rate This growth rate is generated by investing in new projects that is flowing back money into firm operations. This will also reduce the payout ratio that is the level of dividends. This relationship between growth return on equity and payout ratio can be expressed as noted here. Growth rate G equal to flow back ratio into return on equity where flow back ratio equal to 1 minus payout ratio. We also noted that firms may often exhibit high growth rates in the short term. 
These growth rates may not be sustainable in long term and therefore the dividend discounting formula needs to be employed in different stages. The final stage where perpetual cash flow formula is employed should comprise the maturity stage with steady state growth. Stock price, growth and earnings per share. We'll understand the difference between the growth stocks and income stocks. We'll also examine the concept of the present value of growth opportunities PVGO in this context. Investors often contrast growth with income stocks. Growth stocks offer capital gains. This is ascribed to the fact that these stocks have high future earnings growth potential and therefore their appreciation in prices. Contrast this to income stocks that offer regular income in the form of cash dividends. This is an interesting difference. Consider a simple example of a company that doesn't grow at all. It pays out most of the earnings and does not blow back any. Thus, it produces a constant stream of cash flows in the form of dividends similar to a perpetual bond. Mature companies with stable operations rarely find projects with abnormal returns. So it is not unusual for them to distribute a large share of earnings to stockholders. If liquid and efficient firm markets are available, these stockholders can invest the money in financial markets according to their risk tolerance in appropriate investments. If this company pays all of its earnings as dividends amounting to $10 and is currently valued at $100, then one can easily compute its expected returns as shown here. Expected returns equal to dividend yield equal to div1 upon p0, which is also in this case same as earnings price ratio. That is EPS1 upon p0, here EPS1 is earnings per share. In this case, expected returns equal to 10 upon 100 equal to 10%. This is the expected interest rate or the rate of return expected by shareholders from this firm. Also, if one discounts the dividends of this company till perpetuity, that is p0 equal to div1 upon r, one should be able to obtain the current price that is $100. Let us consider the case of a growth firm. This firm is investing most of its earning internally rather than paying dividends. Let us assume that this is an investment of $10 at the end of year at equal to 1. This would also mean no dividends next year. The company also expects that it, this investment opportunity has a return of 10% which is same as the market capitalization rate that is return that is also expected by current shareholders. That means in each of the subsequent years, the company would add an additional $1 from this investment. Let us try to value this opportunity with DCF valuation technique. Net present value that is NPV of this project equal to minus C0 plus div1 upon R equal to minus 10 plus 1 upon 1.0, which is equal to 0. This is an interesting but unexpected result. The result suggests that this project opportunity did not add any value to the firm. The reduction in value due to loss of dividends worth $10 is exactly offset by the additional perpetual dividends worth $1 generated from this project. For the firm, NPV of this project is zero. Mathematics apart, the simple financial reason is that this project offered a return of 10%, that was the market capitalization rate of the firm. That is, investors were expecting a return of 10% on their investment in the firm. That means, if the firm distributed these cash flows to investors, they would have obtained the same 10% returns by investing in financial market instruments of the same risk. Therefore, they do not have any additional value to firm because of this investment. Let us consider four examples of different returns from this project. We compute the current share price for all these different returns. Please observe that in those cases where NPV is negative, the price to earnings ratio is less than 10 and more than 10 where NPV is positive. Also, where the NPV of the new project is 0, the P ratio is 10. This also gives some intuition that the value of share price can be distributed in two components. First component, the capitalized value of earnings under no growth policy. That is the case where there are no projects with returns of more than capitalization rate of cost of equity capital. Second component is the present value of growth opportunities that is PVGO. This relationship can be shown here as P0 equal to EPS1 upon R which is the capitalization of earnings plus PVGO that is present value of growth opportunities or EPS1 upon P0 equal to R into 1 minus PVGO upon P0. This formula suggests that earnings to price ratio will be equal to the cost of equity that is market capitalization rate. If there are no growth opportunities, however, if there are growth opportunities, projects with positive NPVs, this formula will underestimate R. 
if the managers invest money in projects with negative NPVs, then the formula will overestimate the value of R. Also, for an income stock, if firms invest in projects that have zero NPV, the future expected earnings and dividends may still grow, but this growth will have zero NPV. That is no contribution to the current price. Therefore, this stock will still not be a growth stock and in the sense will remain an income stock only. Moreover, if the company invests in a project with negative NPV, that is a project at below market capitalization rate, the earnings may increase but the share value will reduce. We will illustrate the computation of PVGO with a simple numerical example. Consider a company COMCOM with market capitalization rate of 15% and return on equity that is ROE of 25%. COM has earnings of $8.33 and a payout ratio of 0 0.6. The company is expected to pay a dividend of $5 in the next year and thereafter the dividend is expected to increase indefinitely by 10% a year. We can use our perpetual growth DCA formula to work out the current share price as shown here. P0 equal to div1 upon r minus g equal to 5 upon 15 percent minus 10 percent equal to 100 dollars. The company is flowing back 40 percent of earnings with an ROE that is return on equity of 25 percent. Growth rate of the firm g equal to 40 percent into 25 percent equal to 10 percent. As an hypothetical case, assume a no growth policy that is all earnings are distributed or flowed back in projects that offer returns that are the same as market capitalization rate of 15 percent. In that case, the price or market capitalization value would have been EPS upon R that is 8.33 upon 0 0.15 equal to 55.56 dollars. But we already know that this value of is 100 dollars. Remember our earlier discussions, the difference of 100 minus 55.56 that is equal to 44.44 dollars must be the amount that investors are paying for growth opportunities available with the firm that is PBGO. Let us try and break down this figure of $44.44. The company flows back 40% of earnings in the first year. In the first year, this amount is 8.33 minus 5 equal to 3.33 dollars. This amount is invested at a return of 25% that is 3.33 into 25% equal to 0 0.83 dollars earnings starting from year 2. The present value of this investment at equal to 1 can be computed as shown here minus 3.33 plus 0 0.83 upon 0 0.15 equal to 2.22 dollars. Also, it is known to us that firms earnings are growing at 10 percent. Therefore, we can expect this 2.22 dollar additional earnings to also grow at the same rate of 10 percent. That means in the second year, we will have an additional earning of 2.22 into 1.10 equal to 2.44 dollars and 2.44 into 1.1 .1 equal to 2.69 dollars in the third year and so on. At 10 percent capitalization rate, let us compute the present value of all these incremental cash flows starting from the year 1 at 2.22 dollars. This can be computed as shown here. PVGO equal to 2.22 upon 0 0.15 minus 0 0.10 equal to 44.44 dollars. .44. This also confirms our earlier postulation that is the current value of share price equal to present value of earnings plus present value of growth opportunities. In this case, we can compute the current value of share price as shown here, P0 equal to EPS1 upon R plus PVGO that is equal to 55.56 plus 44.44 equal to $100. Please note that COMCOM is not a growth stock because its earnings are growing at 10%. It's a growth stock because the PV of its future investments account for a significant portion of about 44% of its stock price. Thus, Today's stock price reflects investor expectation about earning power of the firm's current value and future assets. To summarize, in this video, we discussed the key differences between the growth stocks and value stocks. Growth stocks have high future earning potential. This is ascribed to the fact that these firms have projects with positive NPVs when discounted at the market capitalization rate of the firm. In contrast, an income stock does not have positive NPV projects and therefore may find it suitable to pay out most of the earnings in the form of dividends. The key difference between these two kinds of stocks can be examined with the help of the present value of growth opportunities that is PVGO. For growth stocks, PVGO comprises a major share of the firm value. By contrast, for income stocks, PVGO is a very small fraction of the overall firm value. A simple example of business valuation with DCF method. We will value an entire business using our discounted cash flow that is DCF valuation method. Let us start with some basic information and assumptions about this business. The business has an appropriate discount rate of 
the business grows at a rapid pace of 20 percent per annum for five years then falls to 10, 13 percent for years six and seven and finally settles down at a six percent steady state growth rate thereafter a return on asset roa amounts to a constant 12 percent the blowback ratio is derived from the expected growth of the business using the formula g equal to return on assets or return on equity blowback ratio starting with an amount of 10 million dollars in the first year the cash flows are provided here please note assuming no debt in the business would also mean that assets reflect the equity investment therefore roa would be same as roe there are two components to this value the value of cash flows till year 7 before the steady state growth rate is achieved horizon value of cash flows from year 8 onwards when the steady state growth is achieved let us value these two components pre steady state growth rate period value that is present value of cash flows equal to minus of 0 0.8 divided by 1.10 minus 0 0.96 divided by 1.10 raised to the power 2 minus 1.15 divided by 1.10 raised to the power 3 and so on so forth up to minus 0 0.23 upon 1.1 raised to the power 6 equal to minus 3.59 dollars then steady state growth period value or horizon value the present value of horizon value equal to 1.59 upon 0 0.10 minus 0 0.06 into 1 upon 1.1 raised to the power 6 equal to 22.42 dollars that is total value of minus 3.59 plus 22.42 equal to 18.83 million dollars it should be slightly troublesome for us that more than 800 percent of the business value is coming as horizon value which is extremely sensitive to the steady state growth assumption therefore this method to arrive at the value may look mathematically elegant but the values obtained can deviate a lot from their fair and efficient values a slightly more evolved method to compute these horizon values is to extract the p ratios for more mature companies traded in financial markets for example if you observe in financial markets that the average p ratio for a mature business with a similar profile is 11 that is investors in efficient markets are paying 11 dollars price for each dollars of earnings then you can easily compute the horizon value in this case as provided here that is present value of horizon value equal to 11 into 3.18 into 1 upon 1.1 raised to power 6 equal to 19.75 or one can also observe the market to book values of mature companies for example if you observe that average market to book asset values for the similar mature companies 1.4 that is for each dollar book value of asset investors are willing to pay 1.4 dollar the market then one can easily compute the horizon value of the firm as shown here that is present value of horizon value equal to 1.4 into 26.48 divided by 1.1 raised to the power 6 equal to 22.93 these values provide comparable benchmarks to ensure that our figures have a sense of reality and incorporate the current market expectations again these numbers are also only estimates and do not provide the complete truth nonetheless this is a useful number to help us estimate what investors are currently willing to pay to summarize in this video we valued an entire business with the help of free cash flow to firms we started by projecting the earnings investment flow back and finally the cash flows we also made certain assumptions about the growth of the business the projected cash flows are divided in three stages depending upon their cash flow profile the last stage is considered where cash flows have attained the long term steady state growth rate the cash flows in this stage are valued using the perpetuity formula and are referred to as horizon value Finally, we computed the present value of these cash flows and summed them up to value the entire business. This valuation may be considered with the following caveat. The horizon value or terminal value is a major component of all the overall value of the business. This value is extremely sensitive to the assumption of market capitalization rate and the steady state growth rate assumptions. To summarize, in this lesson, we applied our knowledge of DCF valuation technique to value common stocks and business. Essentially, the value of stock is equal to the discounted dividend payments expected to be received in perpetuity. Here, the discount rate is the rate of interest investors expect to receive on other securities with the same risk. Since common stocks do not have a fixed maturity, the dividend payments comprise an indefinite stream of dividends. The resulting formula to compute the value of a common stock has been discussed in this lesson. However, investors often do not plan to hold the stock for eternity and have finite investment horizons. 
these investment horizons involve returns in the form of dividend and capital gains. For example, in our previous discussions, we noted that in an investor plans to hold a stock for one year, his investment horizon is only one year. Also, he is expecting returns in the form of dividends and capital appreciation, that is, increase in the share price. Thus, the price that she is willing to pay today can be expressed in the form of dividend received during the year and the expected price received at the end of the year, at which she is hoping to sell the stock. The resulting expression has been shown in the lesson and this logic can be extended to holding periods of 1, 2, 3 and further years. This formula also represents the market equilibrium. If the price deviates from these values and the stock is overpriced or underpriced and do not match with the investor expectations of fair and efficient value of the stock. In that case, buyers or sellers would participate in large volumes to buy the underpriced security and sell the overpriced security. This excess buying and selling of security will force the stock price to become efficient and aligned to market expectations and reach market equilibrium. We also applied the concept of indefinitely growing perpetuity to value the stocks with infinite stream of dividends. We also discussed several problems associated with this formula. This formula assumes constant dividend growth in perpetuity. If the firm is yet to attain a steady state growth phase, then one needs to discount the dividend onto one, two, three or more stages, depending upon the nature of growth. The last stage would comprise the steady state growth phase with a growth G, which is employed to compute the horizon values. With the help of this formula, we derived a price formula where the current value of share price is broken into two components. The first component based on discounted earning per shares and second present value of growth opportunities. Here the first component represents the capitalized value of earnings that firm would generate under no growth assumption, that is all the earnings distributed to shareholders. The first component PVGO present value of growth opportunities in the, the net present value of growth opportunities, that is investments into those projects that have a positive NPV when discounted at the market capitalization rate. These investments will help the firm grow. Here, a growth stock is considered where the PVGO is large related to the capitalized value of EPS. These growth stocks are rapidly expanding firms with profitable investments. The valuation of entire business can also be performed using DCF valuation techniques by discounting the free cash flows to business. Usually, free cash flows are forecasted up to a certain horizon, where steady state growth rate is achieved. These cash flows are discounted and their present value is computed. In addition, a horizon value is computed by discounting steady state growth cash flows as perpetuity. Both of these values are added to obtain the value of the business. This two-stage discounting procedure can be extended to three stage or more depending upon the growth profile of the firm. Estimating these horizon values is an extremely difficult task. This is so because horizon values form a major portion of the overall firm value. Moreover, these horizon values are extremely sensitive to the assumption of growth rates and cost of equity capital. Usually, a long-term steady state growth rate is considered for this purpose. Then the growing perpetuity formula is employed to estimate the horizon value. One can also obtain the price to earning that is P ratio or market to book ratios from the mature firms traded on exchanges. These ratios can be used to compute firm values at steady state growth rates and then discounted subsequently to obtain their present values.